I started WikiLeaks to, to solve a very interesting problem to me, um, which was to know the fate of man, to know the fate of mankind, insofar as uh, that development of man is revealed by the development of his in institutions and how they actually behave in practice internally. And the, the great uh, political struggle of mankind, insofar as it's been rational, and we all know politics is largely irrational, but the irrational part, I feel, is sort of random. And the rational part is based upon what we know, what we know about ourselves, what we know about each other, and what we know about how uh, human resources are distributed and how human institutions behave and what sort of internal and external rules uh, we engage in. So that's the purpose of WikiLeaks, to try and understand mankind. And then from that, we can perhaps uh, produce a better or more realistically put, less, worse uh, human civilization. But that's changing. Uh, mankind, in some sense, just having a small glimmer of understanding about how it is progressing uh, through the world, I think is now almost completely eliminated. And not in the way that I expected. We actually have access to much more knowledge about how we work than we ever did before. But it's, be, it's been eliminated through the, the speed of informational processing and therefore the speed of the change of knowledge. Uh, and that's going to, that is rapidly moving into, um, out of, well, that algorithmic processing of knowledge is moving into uh, artificial intelligence. And why artificial intelligence is just another kind of algorithm, I think the scale changes that have occurred in the last seven years are significant enough to classify it as a qualitative change. And that qualitative change means a serious, in my view, very serious threat to the, the stability of human civilizations, not that they should be too stable, uh, and the ability for human beings uh, to organize their fate in an in, in intelligent manner. So I think you guys in both these two dimensions uh, are able to do something. The interesting stuff I can't describe because I'm in an adversarial uh, relationship with a number of states, a really serious adversarial relationship. Um, and then the, the situation for detained people, and I have been detained un, in prison under house arrest and in this embassy without charge at any time in this country uh, for almost eight years now. And the difficulty for uh, people who are detained in one form or another is monotony, absolutely. Uh, so I try and make each day as different as possible, as it possibly can be. Uh, and it's never different enough uh, for me. There's a, a shifting geopolitical constellation. As, as far as the operations of WikiLeaks and other publishers are concerned that are trying to push the envelope. Uh, WikiLeaks is designed in its structure, uh, well, be because it, it kind of suits the sort of things I like doing, uh, to be the boldest, uh, the boldest but still credible publisher. It's an interesting tension, that but still credible. Uh, by, by that, I mean, we're very bold, not so bold that we publish uh, child pornography, uh, th that would certainly be bold, uh, but it's not, not, I think, interesting and credible. Coming out of my experience with dealing with governments and in computer security industry, uh, I got into encryption. I became an encryption en engineer um, and ran my grant one a number of uh, small companies and consultancies. Uh, and after a while, I viewed that the universe was hard enough to understand for human beings without going around encrypting it all the time. And that 
that uh, in some sense that was to make human life harder to understand. And while I understood and even in fact come back, I suppose, to embrace uh, that earlier philosophic, philosophical position of mine that uh, in a computerized civilization, uh, encryption is the fundamental uh, building block of liberty. I think that is, I think that is clear, very interesting philosophically as to why that is, why that is so. Uh, so I then uh, instead thought, well, I should, I should really tackle trying to decrypt physical reality. I, it sound, that sounds mad, but that's what physicists do, right? We try and decrypt physical reality uh, to, to understand time and space, the beginning and end of things. Um, and after, after a while, I felt I had, uh, although physics is very wide, but I felt I had a decent, a decent enough understanding that, that the extra time put in wouldn't produce a great deal more understanding. Uh, and so then I came back taking some of these uh, concepts that have been developed in quantum mechanics about understanding uh, flows of causality, how one thing causes another. And if you look at, look at it through a particular interpretation through the flow of information, of how information from one uh, thing that you're trying to measure goes on to cascade causality across others and then eventually to the person looking at it. Uh, and so I thought I would, why not take that concept, uh, which can perhaps be described in the way that WikiLeaks uses it as causality amplification, some small amount of capital leading to a larger amount of information, leading to a cascade of effect, and, and try and put that into place to, to help understand human civilization and uh, while that's a, in some sense a very ambitious and impossible project, uh, along the way uh, to have some fun and uh, uh, achieve some important uh, uh, blows for justice, which is satisfying when you're doing it. It's very, very, very satisfying to see innocent people, for example, uh, walk out of prison uh, with one of our publications uh, above their head, you know, the key document to use. Back in 2007, when I launched WikiLeaks, I don't know if people can bring their minds back to the cultural dynamics on the internet at that time. It was, in some sense, far more controlling uh, space than it is now. In other senses, far more open, because there weren't the big players uh, didn't dominate it as much as they do now. But the, the fight as to whether a WikiLeaks was culturally acceptable uh, hadn't been had yet. And through uh, succeeding in that fight and defending the organization, we became, in a very unusual way, part of the status quo. Not of the status quo of uh, establishments, obviously. Many establishments are opposed to us because we publish secrets and all establishments are in some sense hypocritical and rely on uh, keeping a different interior world to an exterior presentation. Um, but WikiLeaks became a, a cultural, uh, culturally established such that there would be a tremor uh, sent through the broader internet culture, which is now the broader Western culture, uh, if WikiLeaks were to disappear. And that's a, a very difficult role to be in. What would it mean? It, it would mean that essentially the, the envelope for publishers and freedom of speech and the, the rights of citizens versus institutions and establishments uh, would suddenly contract. Uh, so I personally and WikiLeaks are partly in the business of keeping the envelope wide, being that avant-garde, uh, where we are constantly crashing up uh, against icebergs, constantly uh, trying to, to, to smash through the ice or at the very least maintain position 
so that behind us there is a widened cultural space uh, for liberty, broadly speaking. I mean, uh, you've had some very good speakers that are speaking at the kind of practical everyday computer security industry. Uh, so I'm not going to do that, probably because I wouldn't be that good at it. The, the WikiLeaks has a, a threat model, but it's an exceedingly, it's a very high uh, threat model. Absurd, in fact. I mean, the, the UK government, uh, by 2015, by the middle of 2015, admitted just one department alone had uh, spent 12.6 million pounds. It was very embarrassing, unsurveilling me. It was very embarrassing. And at, so in response, they classified the budget. So the, the budget figures uh, have not been released. And they certainly haven't been released for others. So that's a, a high threat level environment. Um, it's very interesting, I suppose, all the, the means that we've come up with to deal with that environment. But they are, in some sense, unique to a, a, to a small to mid-sized organization operating at, at the highest levels of, of which I'm, I'm not sure that there are any others than us. I suppose that there are some independence groups and terrorist organizations, but the, at least on the terror side, obviously it's a, it's a different game from one that we're, to one that we're engaged in. Okay, but there is a, there is a, a much bigger threat to everyone. Um, and I see it like this. Um, some of you, well, at the time of the Los Alamos project, uh, physics, Western physics, uh, became harmonized because you brought the different physics traditions from across Europe, the leading figures, uh, to the United States and to Los Alamos, and then you had a harmonization of nomenclature uh, and understanding, and those people then spread out. So one of those people was Enrico Fermi, uh, an Italian physicist, very interesting man. One night, Enrico Fermi was out walking uh, amongst Los Al in Los Alamos uh, with some of his physicist buddies, and he looked up at the stars and said, um, where is everyone? And so you're, you're going to freak out a little bit because yes, I'm bringing in the aliens into this part of the talk. Uh, to, to answer this question. Uh, his, his question is very deep. It's that there don't appear to be any. Uh, and by appear, I mean there are no physical signs that we can detect in, in terms of what happens to stars. The energy seems to be constantly boiling off, being wasted into space. Uh, we don't hear radio signals. We don't see anything of civilized life. And yet, in the last 10 years, we see a, uh, in the last 10 years, um, the uh, astrophysics of uh, planetary astrophysics has shown that there's tens of thousands of extrasolar planets uh, that we have actually detected on, on an in individual basis. And from that, you can assemble the probabilities of there being Earth approximating. Um, planets, and there's hundreds of millions, maybe billions, uh, just in this galaxy. So the question then becomes, well, where is the civilized life? Why don't we see it? Why don't we see any signs of it anywhere? And so, so the, the answers to that are, well, it could be the reasons we don't see signs of civilized life uh, with the, our increasingly powerful measurement apparatus is because life simply doesn't evolve life itself. That's why we don't see civilized life. That there's something very rare about the Earth uh, that means that life here evolved. But when we look at the Earth and when we look at extrasolar planets, we don't see any reason why that should be true. And in fact, we, we see uh, organic amino acids uh, in space dust and asteroids and so on. Uh, and we know that asteroids cross uh, pollinate, for example, there's asteroids here um, from Mars, bits of, bits of Earth has gone to Mars, etc. 
when we get hit by an asteroid and stuff flies off, etc. So th there's quite a lot of reason to believe that the basic building blocks of life have spread widely. Uh, so my view, uh, and I think it's the, the only view you can take so far until more data comes in, is that there's something very unstable about civilization. There's something very unstable about technologically advanced civilization that means it doesn't go on for long. And I think the answer to that uh, is the very rapid competition, if you like, the light speed competition that occurs uh, when you wire up the world to itself. And that very rapid competition can have two fates. And number one, it can produce very robust artificial intelligences uh, that are then coupled with their states. You can see that panning out in the United States and China as they each shore up. They're going to take, you know, those two forces are going to take essentially all the market. Uh, and the rapid competition between them with the, with the backing and support of the states behind them and the, the exacerbation of the uh, commercial competition through geopolitical competition will lead uh, to an uncontrollable desire for growth in artificial intelligence capacity. Uh, yeah, leading, leading to very severe conflict or, or stultification. There's interesting, you can follow these trajectories in different ways. It takes, it takes too long to describe. Um, so I, I think that's, that's our biggest threat. It is geopolitical competition, removing what otherwise might be sensible human controls on the development of artificial intelligence. That geopolitical competition uh, harnessed by uh, and itself harnessing uh, the largest artificial intelligence companies to ratchet up a process which human beings can no longer control. Not in the sense of there being killer robots, uh, although, of course, Google is now putting its AI in drones and so on, so yeah, there are killer robots. Uh, not, not in this classic dystopian sense, uh, but rather in a, in a way that comes from understanding how human institutions behave, which is institutions that are built on competition and growing their size and dominating markets, et cetera, take any advantage they get uh, and will continue to ratchet up in competition. And everything that they produce has that DNA in it. Uh, and that's where we're headed. Uh, and that's a, that's a severe threat uh, to human beings in general and all businesses. Uh, but perhaps the, an perhaps the answer to that threat is people understand uh, computer security, offensive computer security in particular, uh, trying to work out what to do about it. The nation states haven't been around that long. Most people don't understand that, that the, West, the Westphalian system has uh, only been around for about 400 years. Uh, and in fact, most uh, nations, not states, but nations, communities of people, um, were not even in the Westphalian system for, for a long time. Um, now, the, you can think about why the Westphalian system, why the nation state system developed. I think it's, I think it's essentially that te technology, including speed of transport, letters, radio communications, et cetera, meant that each uh, center of organization attracted smaller groups of organization to it and they grew and grew and grew and kept growing until they hit the boundaries of others also doing the same. And those, and then there was conflict and then borders were constructed either through, well, unless there were natural borders, borders arose as a result of trying to dampen down the expense of that conflict. Okay, and the, there's clear physical reasons why that arose. It's a, it's a, a geographical uh, conflict and geographical basically means a, a two-dimensional spatial conflict. Um, but the internet has no two-dimensional spatial nature. So in, instead, what you see with the 
uh, conflicts that occur through internet-based organizations and states are increasingly moving onto the internet is a kind of interdigitization of conflict. That, that is, there's no border. Uh, there's no border and it's, it's 220 milliseconds from New York to Nairobi. So why would there ever be uh, peace in such a, such a scenario? There's no border of peace uh, within, within which there's greater cooperation. That's not easy to construct. Now with cryptography, to the degree that it's well engineered, you can create some kinds of borders. In fact, that's uh, what all, in fact, all uh, institutions that are surviving on the internet uh, and anarchic international space are doing. They're creating their own borders using cryptography. But the, yeah. The, the, the size of the attack surface for any decent sized organization and the, the number of people and different types of software and hardware that has to pull inside itself uh, means that that's very, very hard to establish. And things are moving so fast that you, you, I don't think it's really possible for organizations to come up with borders uh, that are predictable enough and stable enough to eliminate conflict. Therefore, uh, there will be more conflict. It's the, the kind of, you know, they're sexy because they have a lot of power and the, they conform to certain uh, classical human models that we've culturally absorbed over the last at least few hundred years. And the, the notion of a, of a well-defined cultural other. Uh, but I think they're, they're small players, really small players in this game as, as it goes forward. I mean, you, you look at what Google and Badu and Tencent and Amazon, Facebook are doing in, in their basically uh, mass open cut harvesting of the um, knowledge of humankind as we express it when we communicate with each other, if some people do on, on Facebook or uploaded YouTube videos or the deals between different companies to get hold of their data. Uh, that classical model, which people in academia have called surveillance capitalism, namely you, uh, put, you acquire capital through surveillance, the capital is the data, and then you sell it to advertisers, basically. Uh, that's changed now. It's, it's, it's really a very, very interesting and important and severe economic change, which is to take the surveillance capitalism model and transform it instead into uh, a model that doesn't yet have a name, but we call it the AI model, which is to use bait and switch techniques that Google and others have done uh, to provide enticing services to get hold of data, and then using that vast reservoir, uh, train artificial intelligences of different, of different kinds, and thereby replacing uh, not just intermediating sectors, uh, which things, you know, m most things you do on the internet in some sense, more efficient intermediations, but to actually uh, take over the transport sector or to create whole new sectors. And even just the transport sector alone, this is, uh, trillion, worth trillions of dollars more than the advertising intermediation sector. So, so it's, uh, uh, and, and to be, be a player in that game, you have to have the vast reservoirs of data. Um, and Europe, Europe doesn't even have one. It's incredible. It, it, it could have perhaps, perhaps could have struggled forth with one. Uh, but of course, the, uh, um, AI companies in the UK have mainly been bought out by, by US companies. Uh, and similarly with uh, Germany, I'm not sure whether, I don't know whether China has been buying out European companies. But if you look, look at things like the European uh, privacy uh, legislation and the, the tradition of privacy, not so much from UK, but uh, emanating from Germany and uh, Germanic Europe culturally, that, um, Uh, wh while, while it's kind of dear to me as, as someone who understands about the importance of privacy, 
Uh, it has meant that a European company has not been able to emerge, although I think there's other reasons as well why it hasn't, uh, that could harness all the data of Europe, pull it together, and use that to train artificial intelligences in, in the way uh, Chinese and American companies have. And it's the, it's an interesting question. Uh, I think it's, you know, the, the answer is not terribly interesting and a bit obvious, uh, which is vast databases of IDs are economically interesting to institutions for other reasons. And the centralization of those vast databases that then makes the marginal cost of stealing each ID lower. And the uh, globalization of principally commerce means that you can use IDs in more places. But let's kind of pull back and, and look at it at a, at a more philosophical perspective. Uh, I say that this generation well, that perhaps our generation, but anyway, this generation being born now, uh, in, in seconds in most countries, oh, sorry, very shortly in most countries, and it's already happened in, in say, China, most European countries, the United States, is, is the last free generation. Mm -hmm. uh, you were born and either immediately or within, say, a year, uh, you're known globally. Your, your identity in one form or another coming as a result of your idiotic parents uh, pl plastering your name and photos over, over Facebook uh, or as a result of insurance applications or passport applications, uh, transport uh, on airlines, etc. You, you are known to all the world's major powers, all the world's major uh, state powers and all the world's major commercial powers. That's a very different situation for individuals to be in than they have previously been in. That, that a small child now, in some sense, has to, has to negotiate its relationship with all the world's major powers. Of, of course, in practice, it can't do anything. Its parents are, are uh, not managing that negotiation. But it put, put, puts us in a, I think, a very different position in the, in the sense that very few, in fact, maybe only a few people in this audience, very technical, ca technically capable people, uh, uh, are able to no longer, uh, able to live apart, to choose to live apart, to choose to go their own way. They must be part of not only the state, but the major state-like corporations, so powerful, they may as well be states, uh, and not just their own state, but other states as well. That's a, a significant change, cultural change for humanity. It, it smells a little, it smells, it smells a bit like totalitarianism, ter, totalitarianism in some way. Obviously the world is different, but there's some feeling about it, which is totalitarian. And so what, so what is the answer uh, for nearly everyone that is an inescapable conclusion? So, it, so is, is the answer that we, that we all have to be part of the state? We all have to be part of managing the ongoing evolution of our cultural, uh, national, uh, commercial, in, international structures because we can't escape from them. Well, I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, journalists have one of the lowest approval ratings of all professions. I think the, the last study in the United States was about 25%. I think lawyers are just slightly lower. Congressmen are way lower. And, and, and just about everyone else is higher. Why, why is that? Well, it's, it's a sad thing. It's a, it's a really sad thing. As, as someone who... Uh, loves to document how human civilization actually works. Um, we're in constant uh, warfare with those people who are trying to distort the understanding of how, how human beings actually behave, uh, 
including distortions by proxy, which is to, to you know, come up with nonsense about WikiLeaks or, or me. Uh, I mean, there's been, there's been a lot of quite, yeah, there's a lot of amazing plots uh, that, that we have uncovered, uh, yeah, in one form or another. I think, think my uh, the favorite uh, allegation is that I'm a cat torturer. Um, no, seriously, AFP, uh, Aja France Press, put that everywhere and, and uh, even, into the New York, even into the New York Times. So there's a, I, I don't really know where to start for people who aren't familiar with this kind of disgusting uh, machine that the media is and how it works. Perhaps it's enough, it's enough to say uh, that most human wars have come about as a result of lies. And that seems absolutely clear in democracies, that democracies have to be lied into war. Uh, it's a, it's a, a very serious ongoing problem. It has resulted in the, in the deaths of millions of people in the last 50 years. And you can do a calculation. How many deaths is each journalist responsible for? And, and I did it in the United States because not meaning to pick on it, uh, but the, there's figures for the, the total number of political journalists. It's about 5,000. It's, it's something like 200 kills per journalist uh, in the last 20 years, just the US journalists alone, because they would not do their job, they would not be accurate, uh, and because they lacked courage. No, this, this is another one of these propaganda talking points. Uh, not to criticize you, I, I, I know you're trying to give me something to bounce off. Uh, but the United States government had to admit under oath uh, in the trial of Chelsea Manning in, in 2013 that it could not find a single instance of someone who had been physically harmed uh, as a result of uh, our publications to that point. Uh, now, I should say that if, if you work on an industrial scale, Everyone knows you work on industrial scale, then the, the world is big uh, and there's a lot of re reverberating dynamics uh, that you can never properly play out. It's the same for car manufacturers, it's the same for big publishers. But thus far, uh, there's no example of that happening for us. Yeah. I, I don't know. It, it's it's uh, no. I mean, I do know, but I don't know what I should answer in response to that question. Uh, it's a, a interesting diplomatic back and forth about well, um, really about the, in my view, the alliance structure, the Western alliance structure between the United Kingdom and the United States. Uh, that's caused problems for many people in the UK for a long time with unjust, injustice in relation to extradition cases and quite, quite a bit of prestige as well, quite a bit of state pride uh, in, involved. States never, never liked to be forced to follow their own, own rules. In fact, uh, they define themselves in significant degree as having power by violating their own rules. That's, that's one of the key ways in which states uh, demonstrate the supremacy of their power is that they're the one group that doesn't have to obey its own rules. And that's, that's true in my situation. In the, the 10 year period is hard to predict. And that's the, and that's the big problem. I don't see the, the National Security Agency, GCHQ, Five Eyes Alliance, more broadly, France a bit, Russia a bit, China mostly domestically, uh, have been engaged in mass surveillance. Uh, and the Five Eyes countries for, well, serious comp computational mass surveillance, about, about 20 years. That's something that is of such scale uh, that it strategically affects the development of um, human civilization. 
In fact, it's called strategic interception for exactly that reason. Now, strategic interception is slowly being degraded. And that was a very important thing to do. Uh, because, and, and I guess some people can't see the, the reasons, but as we threw, as uh, the majority of the world's populations threw itself onto the internet, we merged our human societies with the internet. So the result is that the, uh, whatever the security structure uh, of the internet, our human societies also became part of that. And that structure was in part mass strategic interception. Now, uh, I mean, I worked on this for years, many other people as well, and we had our, a really big hit with in 2013 with the Edward Snowden re revelations that smashed that into the consciousness, not of the average person, I think that was a negative actually, because they all became paranoid about what they were saying and became fearful and conformist. But we smashed that into the minds of engineers and engineers thereby felt ennobled and so they were part of the, the flow of human destiny by including encryption into the communications protocols. Uh, so that has checked a very dangerous development. And we're left, we're left then uh, with the other dangerous developments of which you know, the important ones are the ones that I described. Uh, I don't think that um, now, now and perhaps in the next three years, we're going to see computer hacking at scale. People talk about it as if it's happening at scale at the moment. It's not happening at scale, not compared to strategic interception. Uh, but the AIification of computer hacking is something that will happen at scale because, because you're automating it. Now, within AI, the, how, you, how, you, you, how you train AIs uh, for discrete problems, and computer hacking, it, many aspects of it is a discrete problem. Uh, there hasn't been significant progress on, in my view. What there has been enormous progress on is how you kind of map through a space uh, which is in between, uh, in between a, a, f a fluid problem and a discrete problem. And so an example of a space like that uh, is the game of Go. That, that's a, a very good example toy space where each step in Go is discrete, but you've got enough pieces and enough board that it almost starts to become a fluid. And when you assemble all the computer hacking techniques together, there's so many and so many targets that now, now you're starting to look like, uh, now, you, now you have uh, a search space that it starts to look more like a fluid. And these search spaces we can increasingly conquer. Uh, and, at the, and when you have very large computer programs, uh, and I suppose when you, fu when you fuzz large computer programs, if they're, so, if they're large enough, you have enough discrete, uh, uh, discrete chinks in the attack surface that altogether they're more like a fluid. So I think inevitably we're going to see this AI AIification of computer hacking attacks. And that will then be merged with other search spaces. And those other search spaces look like, well, what is the informational space? The, because in the, in the end, what you really want is machines and human beings to make particular decisions. So you, you bring to bear, you, you acquire as much knowledge as possible, and then map it back in onto the actors whose decisions you want to affect. Uh, and so there's a lot of talk about hybrid warfare. 
some of it legitimate, some of it overblown. It's actually been something that's been around for, for many, many years. But I think this notion of bringing together different search spaces in AI that are large enough to have a semi-fluid property uh, means that you can then go through the search spaces of all of them together. And that can produce something very powerful and from a human perspective, completely incomprehensible. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess there's a, human beings are very adaptable. It's, a, it's their best quality and their worst quality. They adapt to doing nasty things. They adapt to being on the receiving end of injustice and, and they cease complaining about it. Uh, the, the, real, the real question is um, where, when, not whether, but when uh, the UK government uh, will follow the, its treaties that has, it has signed up to. And if, we, if we look in my particular situation, okay, yes, everyone understands there's a vast uh, political and geopolitical dynamic that's intimately connected with the United States. But, that, but it is instrumentalized in practice by UK intelligence services and police who, who will physically arrest me and hold me for whatever the US wants to do with me. So, but what is the excuse to actually do that, to, to uh, enable those budget spends? Uh, the excuse is, in a case that I was never charged for, where the extradition warrant has already been dropped, where I repeatedly won, uh, they say that we're, they're going to keep around the warrant the UK end of the warrant for the Swedish extradition, which I won. They're gonna keep around that warrant despite me winning that because I, ca because I came in here and perhaps they might want to, they haven't, but perhaps they might want to charge me with a bail violation. This is the technical excuse. They haven't. Twice the UK courts have refused to do so. Uh, why? Well, because if you move your house arrest location to pursue a parallel legal process, a higher legal process, which is an asylum application, that's not a bail violation. Uh, okay, but what if it was? What if you disagree with that analysis and you say that is a bail violation? Well, uh, okay, even before I came into this embassy and applied for asylum, which is everyone's right, everyone in this audience, uh, if, you, if you are genuinely being persecuted, um, uh, even before I came in this embassy, if you add up the time in prison, under a very grueling house arrest for 18 months, I've already done three times the maximum amount of time under UK sentencing legislation. And UK sentencing legislation values house arrest at 50% of prison time. That's the law. So there's, not only is this a, a bogus warrant that it has no purpose, if you, as the uh, judge did a couple of weeks ago, you say, well, maybe, if he came to court, I might want to charge him. So that's why I need to keep that warrant around. Okay, but if that occurred, there could be no possible prison time because I've already served more than three times the maximum possible prison time, even before uh, I was awarded asylum. If you include the time in the embassy, which you should, because the UN has assessed it and said, if you illegally block, if you legally block someone from leaving the country, that's a form of detention. That would be 10 times the amount. So the real question is, when is the UK government going to uphold uh, the treaty obligations that it has signed and uphold basic justice principles within UK law? Well, we've published a series uh, called The Spy Files uh, uh, that documented these conferences, private, government conferences where the, diff the different uh, mass surveillance vendors and targeted hacking vendors uh, like Gamma Group present their wares. And actually there's quite a lot to be gleaned from that. And whenever you're talking about a big, well, a sizable uh, industrial sector, it's impossible to really hide its shadows now. You, you're, you always see the shadow. You don't always see the thing, but you can see, you know, a little shadow of a foot sticking out somewhere. Uh, and through that, you can map out some of the contours. That is an indirect enough process and a conflict-free enough process that it is kind of hard to get the public really involved in it. 
we had done all that, for example, uh, before the Edward Snowden publications. And it was, but it was the conflict in the Edward Snowden publications is what really drew people in. Because it's not simply that WikiLeaks was saying it was important or Gwen Greenwald was saying it was important. Uh, it's that the President of the United States was saying it was important. Look, this is an outrageous situation. And so people went, oh, so power is concerned about this. Therefore, it in itself must be powerful. Um, yeah, I, th I think it impinges on a deeper question, which is the world is complex. How much of it do you need to know directly and how much of it can you delegate? Now, I love the idea of intelligence agencies. I'm a fan of the idea of intelligence agencies because it has the word intelligence in it. Uh, and I like, I like that people know things. Um, and maybe they might make sensible decisions if they know things. Intelligence agencies, when they're, when they're acting their best, uh, reduce fear and reduce paranoia. Because if, if there's something that you don't know, um, hype merchants can fill this black box with the, the most terrifying possibility of what might be in there. But if you really do know another state's uh, weapon systems and capacities, etc., it might reassure you that actually they're not as bad as the most catastrophic scenario. And so they can actually contribute towards peace in that way. The problem is, it's a principal agent dilemma. So th this is a classical uh, problem when dealing, say, with lawyers, which is you hire a lawyer to work for you and represent you and act in your interest. But of course, the lawyer is also always trying to act in their own interest uh, and inject their own interest into your equation. So how do you police that? How do you police it with lawyers? Well, you police it by constantly looking at their work and, and trying to do random samples, I guess, introspecting into their work to, to see if the claims made are justified. That is the fundamental problem with intelligence agencies and it's the fundamental problem with delegation of de delegation of assessment about how the world is working. You can't completely delegate. You can't delegate because human beings inevitably are corrupt and cut corners and act in their own interests and not of the person who has appointed them. And in that case, for example, in the UK intelligence services, which have a role, an important role, every state needs something like an intelligence service to uh, protect it from interference by other states. But without insight, deep insight into how those organizations are acting, uh, they go astray. So intelligence agencies must be transparent. It's vital that they are transparent. And some of that, and because they are deeply interconnected with, the, with industry, uh, some of that transparency is provided by enforcing transparency on the industry itself, including at these uh, conferences. Uh, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a big dilemma. Uh, one of our lawyers, uh, who of course we will have to educate them about, you know, different counter surveillance techniques. But they said, God damn it. You know what we should do? We, we, should, we should like buy up some chunk of Madagascar or Patagonia or somewhere and just ban every electronic device from it. It's like a, a radio wave electronic, uh, well, high intensity radio wave, uh, free area because of that uh, constant buffeting uh, that we have by principally commercial organizations trying to harvest our interactions with the world. That's, that's the, um, yeah, that's the principal economic model that all these AI companies have had and the traditional uh, surveillance uh, capitalism companies have had. And the, the, the number of degrees of interaction, so what do I mean by that? Um, if, you, if you can't imagine a space of interactions, the, the number 
of types of interaction, the frequencies of interaction between you and everything else in the space is dramatically in, uh, increasing. And in a way you can consider each one of these degrees of freedom is, is kind of like a triangulation. So to triang triangulate something in a two dimensional space, well, okay, you just need two, two directions, uh, two signals, directional signals. Uh, but we are giving off, uh, if someone has is using a mobile phone, for example, we're probably giving off a couple of hundred of these on average per second. Some, something like that. Maybe not, maybe not quite as, maybe, okay, maybe, maybe a dozen, perhaps. Uh, although if you do video, of course, there's vast, vast amounts more. So anyway, between dozens and, and hundreds of um, measurements, we are emanating constantly. And so if you collect those together, you can effectively triangulate someone's uh, activities and behavior. And I don't think by chopping out uh, many of them or adding uh, kind of chaff, uh, cover, that you can make that much, make that much of a difference. And increasingly, increasingly it's less. Um, and the, in terms of the Internet of Things, there's research prototypes now, which I assume are being used by uh, intelligence agencies, of very small electronic circuits uh, that you can just put in paper or put and paint on the, on the walls uh, that are, pa are powered by the GSM stations. And they, they operate as the GSM radio wave passes through them. It gives them enough power for a very small amount of time to do things. So obviously that tendency is going to continue. It's not the, like the internet of things. It's, it's uh, if you like, uh, intelligent evil dust uh, scattered everywhere, like, like confetti in everything. So I think it's increasingly hard for human beings to work out how to deal with that. And, and the, only way I, the only way I can see is that as, that we've got to securitize this problem. Computer security industry is, is you know, it's been engaged in outrageous securitization for a very long period of time, hyping up threats, et cetera. I get how the game is played. Uh, it needs to be securitized in a different way. We need to securitize the, by securitize I mean you turn something into a threat and thereby change behavior or get economic gain from it. Um, so we need to securitize the threat to elites by these developments. The people who run these companies, it's a threat to them. It's a, it's, a, it's a threat to the most powerful people in society. And to eliminate the notion that there's a place that powerful people can hide from or skilled people can hide from this phenomenon. Uh, and that's the way to get uh, all those people who have an ability to make a difference to make a difference.